Renewed tension in northern Mali after Al-Qaeda-linked fighters claimed control of the area where Tuareg rebels recently declared an independent state. Just what does this mean for the region? Is a military intervention by regional powers an option? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Rida Fakhri. It was already a tenuous truce between Ansar al-Din and the Tuareg in northern Mali, but groups linked to al-Qaeda have now seized control of the northern town of Gao. Tension between the unlikely alliance got worse in recent weeks, with the Ansar al-Din insisting on Islamic law. The Tuareg, though, want a secular state. Groups affiliated with al-Qaeda have destroyed several shrines in Timbuktu, which they say go against Islamic principles, and with other players like the Movement for Jihad and Unity in West Africa, or Mujao, now gaining influence in the region. Is there any hope for unity in the fractured region? If we take a quick look back at the events leading up to the latest violence, a few key moments stand out. Accused of not dealing with the Tuareg rebellion, President Amadou Toumani Toure was deposed by military officials ahead of presidential elections in March. A month later, with this power vacuum, Tuareg rebels take control of northern Mali. A few days later, the military hand over power to a civilian government led by President Giancunda Traore. In May, the Tuareg, MNLA and Ansar al-Din, an al-Qaeda-affiliated group, merge and declare northern Mali an Islamic state. But the truce is short-lived. On Wednesday, Mujao, another al-Qaeda-linked group, took control of the headquarters of separatist rebels in northern Mali. At least 20 people were killed. Now, as tensions in northern Mali rise between rival rebel groups, attention is turning to how neighboring countries, including Algeria, will deal with this conflict on its southern border. Both groups pose a threat to Algeria. Mujao claimed responsibility in April for the kidnapping of seven Algerian officials. The group says it is affiliated with al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, an armed group that Algeria has been fighting for years. But their rivals in northern Mali, the MNLA, also have the Algerian government concerned. An independent Tuareg state in today's northern Mali could be a destabilizing factor for the sub-region. So, will regional powers intervene militarily in Mali? For more on this, I'm joined by our three guests in London, Mohamed Larbi Zitoud, former Algerian diplomat. Mr. Zitoud was the former deputy ambassador to Libya. Also joining us from London, Jeremy Keenan, professor of social anthropology at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. He is author of several books on the Sahara, including The Dark Sahara, America's War on Terror. Joining us on the line from Bamako is Tiebile Drame. He is the former Malian foreign minister. Mr. Drame is the leader of the Anti-Coup Front, a group of political organizations which opposes military rule in Mali. So let's begin with our guest in Bamako, Mr. Drame. What started off largely as a mainly Tuareg rebellion led by the MNLA in northern Mali seems to quickly have morphed into a takeover by Islamist groups who seem now to be firmly in control of Timbuktu and Gao. How concerned are you about these developments? The rebel groups uh, face control of the two-thirds of the country. At the beginning, you have the MNLA, the Tuareg rebels. I think today they must be thinking of their responsibility in the collapse of the country. How does the emergence of the Islamist groups change the nature, the dynamics of this crisis? Of course it changes a lot of things. It's, and we, we mean that... Uh, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb uh, had itself in Mali, one must recognize it, before the overthrow of President uh, Amadou Toumani Touré. But since the war declared by the MNLA, Al-Qaeda took an advantage of this situation. And today, we have two sort of Mali under control of Islamic groups. It changed a lot of things because what's happening in Timbuktu show that Till where these groups are ready to go to reinforce their control on this vast part of our country. I think it is a new challenges for this country, unfortunately, which is in a very fragile situation with a government which is a minority government, therefore a very weak government. But it's also a challenge for the whole region, the whole region in West Africa. 
not only for Sahelian countries, but also for our neighboring countries such as Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal. You say there are many challenges. Indeed, there are. If these Islamist groups are now at the forefront of what is going on in Mali, certainly in northern Mali, what chances are there for a negotiated solution? Well, I must confess that it remains a very little room for negotiated solution. We must try to talk again to the Malian among the Islamic group. I mean, mainly Ansardin. Ansardin, to our knowledge, is the only Malian group within the groups who have uh, uh, put control today the, country, the north of the country. And we, we, we should assess the, their availability to talk in order to restore peace and the territorial integrity of the country. Uh, concerning the foreign groups, I mean Mujao and the various Katiba and Sariat of Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb, their place should be aware outside the Malian territory. This is not their country, and we don't understand what they are looking for in this country. So the Malian should be ready to talk to Ansardin and to find a way, although we are aware that Ansardin has connection with some of the Katibat of Al-Qaeda, mainly the Sariat el Ansar. But we think since we are Malian, we should seek to talk to them. But the foreigners in this context should leave, uh, should leave Mali. And we should be helped. The Mali government and Malian people should be helped to get these outside groups to leave the country. Speaking of outside groups and outside influence, Mohamed Larbi is it too. There are those who accuse the Algerian government of fomenting uh, the crisis, the violence that goes on in northern Mali, of in fact trying to support this tribal war in order to stop a Tuareg independent state. Is there much substantial evidence that, that would support this theory? Um, definitely the Algerian regime is um, involved and heavily involved in what's going there. And um, they have been involved, uh, what has been involved for the last uh, uh, 22, 23 years um, since the beginning of the 90s. But recently, um, and um, the DRS, which is the Algerian Secret Services, is um, since 2003 playing another game, in fact, in, in, in the region where they want uh, to manage the instability. Instability which turned to be uh, absolutely disordered the last uh, few months. Uh, this is um, but what evidence do you have? Uh, what evidence do you have to support these accusations? Because Tuareg grievances are not new. In fact, there have been several rebellions that go back to 1916. And what would be the interest? What would be the benefit for the Algerian government to foment violence and instability yeah, on its border? Definitely, um, a rebellion, uh, Tuareg rebellion, was there. I mean, for many decades, and uh, the, the Tuareg, in general, they are they are fighting for their freedom and for their liberation, or at least for a minimum of uh, um, autonomy and independence. But um, the, the the Algerian regime and the Libyan regime, also Gaddafi regime, I mean, before the revolution, were um, uh, uh, infiltrating the groups fighting uh, in Niger and in Mali. In order, uh, in the 90s, uh, the Algeria of the 90s was different. I mean, the objective of the Algeria in the 90s was was absolutely different from what's uh, what's going on now. I mean, in the 90s, they were trying to stabilize. I will. Uh, we'll say that they were stabilizing the area or the region, but in, um, from the beginning of 2003 and with them uh, working as um, the sole agent of the American for the region and fighting terrorism um, um, on the on, on um, uh, international level, and the Algerian were waiting and wanting to be integrated on this fight because it goes for the survival of the regime. The regime has always, um, since the coup d'etat of the 11th of January, has always played this um, card of uh, fighting terrorism. And since 2001, uh, uh, since the 11th of September events, it, uh, the regime was absolutely integrated, completely integrated on the American strategy, on the Western strategy of fighting terrorism. And they find um, they have to show that there is something uh, going on. And we know that uh, Bush doctrines was based on where Al-Qaeda is, they are going to go. 
uh, and Al Qaeda has been created on the south of uh, Algeria, uh, pushed away to uh, Mali and Niger. And uh, after that, we, um, of course, with a weak regime in Mali, uh, and even uh, uh, now it's even weaker, we, uh, we find ourselves in this uh, uh, completely disorder and chaotic situation. But precisely, there. do you deny then that Algiers has been genuinely concerned about the streaming of uh, fighters and weapons, sophisticated weapons, since the chaotic fall of Gaddafi in Libya from the Libyan border into Algeria? Isn't that what is the main concern for the Algerian government, the fact that there are porous yeah. borders that are very difficult to monitor and through which a lot of weapons come through into Mali? Yeah, definitely it is. Now, definitely it is. And that's why I said, I mean, the situation has completely changed. Uh, while it was in, um, in 2000, between 2003 and 2011, while it was just managing the instability, fomenting, creating the instability and managing it in order to uh, show that they are uh, party integrant, that they are a full party of the fight against uh, the international terrorism. The, uh, now the thing has changed since the fall of uh, Gaddafi regime and we, uh, we are witnessing uh, the uh, tens of thousands of uh, weaponry and sometimes sophisticated weaponry uh, moving to, uh, to the area. And that definitely creates um, a challenge uh, to the Algerian regime, which has, um, uh, in fact, come out of their hands, come out of controls. And this is when you play with fire. I mean, it turns sometimes to um, burn you if you don't um, know how to do it. And now they, are, they don't know how to do it. The thing is absolutely messy. Not uh, the, even in the south, Algeria, there is a little bit, uh, uh, we have just not witnessed um, what uh, uh, it has been mentioned as a terrorist act in uh, Wergula. Uh, a few months ago, it was another terrorist act in, in Tamarast. And either these uh, acts are uh, truly terrorist ones or not, uh, definitely that means there is some insecurity even in uh, South Algeria where the oil, the main oil and gas uh, uh, are there. And this, uh, this is when um, uh, we, you come to uh, a dictator which they think that by managing and by using terrorism, they can always have the upper hand. Sometimes, uh, uh, as I mentioned, it goes Jeremy out Keenan. of control. Uh, sure. And that's we, what we, we are we witnessing got that at point. the If moment. I can just turn to Jeremy Keenan, in, in whose interest is it then to manage this type of situation to make sure that this kind of violence uh, continues and is what we are seeing in Mali a direct result of what's happened in neighboring Libya, the fact that, as we just said, the, the, the breakdown of um, law and order in that country has allowed this type of uh, movement and this uh, type of rapid advancement of groups like the MNLA and others into places like northern Mali? Uh, <coughs> yes, the answer to all those is firstly, uh, in whose interests? Well, it's in Algeria's interests. It's also in American interests to have a degree of instability through this area because, as uh, Mohamed uh, Zitut said, uh, America needs justification to have AFRICOM in Africa, and AFRICOM is expanding. To legitimize that expansion, it needs uh, a degree of sort of low level instability, this type of terrorism in the region. And Algeria has always assisted uh, in providing that since 2003. The question of Libya is a little bit more tricky. Yes. Uh, weapons have flown into the, uh, flowed into the area, uh, and this rebellion was triggered very much by the return of, of Tuareg from, uh, from uh, Libya uh, at the end of last year. Uh, one thing I would say is that I'm not sure the flow of weapons into the region, which is pretty massive, but I don't think it has been quite as high as American and Algerian intelligence services have tried to portray. There's been a bit of propaganda there. And the question I would raise is if 20,000, I mean, that figure has been given, uh, surface-to-air missiles, SAMs, and, and, and man pads, uh, these are uh, 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 handheld missiles, if those have gone into the region, why have no planes been shot down? Uh, there is no evidence in the region of the much feared, if you like, SAM missiles falling into the hands of, of, of uh, either the Tureg um, uh, separatists or, 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 or Al Qaeda groups in the region. But, but there where, may be there, is, but we haven't got hard evidence of that. Where is the hard evidence, Sorry? though, that these kinds of groups it now operating there. in Mali are in fact supported by the Algerian government or by the Algerian intelligence services? Yes, you've got, uh, you've got the MNLA, who we talked about. Uh, they are, if you like, a, a Tureg separatist uh, group. You have one, two, three different 
uh, Islamist groups. You have Ansar al-Din, who we talked about. You have Mujal, who uh, our colleague in, 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 in Bamako mentioned. And we have al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Now, the leaders of those three groups uh, are well connected to the Algerian secret services. Uh, two of the al-Qaeda leaders, uh, the leader of uh, Ansar al-Din and one of the leaders of uh, Mujal all have close connections to the Algerian secret services. They're all also involved in the huge drug trafficking which goes through this region. This is the center of the cocaine trade from South America through to Europe. It comes through this region. Uh, street value is about $10 billion uh, a year, estimated by the United Nations. And that is handled by these various uh, people, but, um, but let me and take including you, take the you, Algerian but, Secret Services. But again, on the point of the Algerian Secret Services, what do you base the, this on? The fact that uh, some of these leaders themselves have said that they have connections to the Algerian Intelligence Services. And how do you explain then that there are seven Algerian diplomats or officials kidnapped by some of these groups and today still in custody? And the fact that just a few days ago there was uh, an attack on Algerian soil claimed by one of these groups? Yes, the seven Algerian diplomats are uh, very questionable whether, whether they were in fact diplomats. The, the senior one, the consul, was a colonel in the DRS, that's the security services. Probably at least one or two others would have been members of the DRS. The other three were just office sort of functionaries. Uh, they were kidnapped by one of the groups whose leader is also a DRS agent. Therefore, you have a question, and I would leave it as a question, do we have a situation of the Algerian security forces actually kidnapping their own people to make it appear that Algeria is also a victim of this situation? Tebile Drame, uh, let me the then ask... On that is open. Let me then ask Mr. Drame in, in Bamako, what is your sense on, on the ground? What kind of foreign support is there for these groups? It's clear that uh, this group cannot, could not have so much strength if they were not receiving some kind of support from, uh, from abroad. The first, the first source of income for this group is the ransom from hostages. This is very clear. <laughs> it's very clear. Every time Western governments pay ransom to get the release of the nationals from uh, uh, the... The, the terrorist group, they reinforce the terrorist groups. Can you be clear about the potential source of support for these groups? Well, I, I, I don't know. Probably Mr. Keenan, who is an expert of this issue, has uh, more information on this issue. From, from this end, from Bamako, from our political view, these groups would not have so much force and, um, and power. They have not received, did not receive support from abroad. Which government is involved? Which regional government is involved? This is another question. But it's clear that they cannot get this thing from a generation spontane. spontaneously. It's not possible. They receive funds from somewhere. They receive army equipment from somewhere. Not only from Libya, because before the Libyan crisis, they were receiving. And achievement. Because one of your guests uh, talked about uh, the Tuareg liberation. Let me put this thing. The MNLA, which launched the attacks against the Malian forces in January, is a very small minority within the Tuareg community. All those who know this region and the people living in this region know that the Tuareg themselves are a minority in northern Mali. And those who f are fighting among the MNLA are a minority among the Tuareg groups. This doesn't mean that we should not pay any attention to their demands and their claims. But their claims for independence is not shared at all by the vast majority of the Tuareg. I'm not talking about the vast majority of the people living in northern Mali, including the Arab community, including Songhoi and Fulani communities. This is black settlers. What kind of effect? Are, are you afraid of some kind of a spillover into Niger? Because you mentioned the sizable uh, Tuareg community. It's about 450,000 in Mali, but it's about 
780,000, close to 800,000 in Niger. And we know that that country has a lot of uh, uh, uranium or a lot of mineral resources. And so any kind of spillover, any kind of rebellion that moves across the borders into Niger could be problematic. How afraid are you if this has to be resolved not by negotiated measures, by, but by military means, as ECOWAS would like to see? Every time you have a problem with Tuareg in Mali, you have it in Niger. This is quite understandable, which the two countries have so common ground, share so co common things, that's clear. We know that the Tuareg in Niger so far remain quiet. Although one of the leaders um, say that if there is any foreign force, right, I mean the ECOWAS one in the, in, in the northern Mali, Tuareg from Niger would probably come to support their foreign brother. That's one thing. But the issue is, today, the situation in Mali has become a threat, not only for the existence of Mali, but a threat for the region. Not only for the Sahelian region, but a threat for the other countries who are neighbors with Mali. So no. looking at what the Niger, options are, perhaps... Niger uh, capital, uh, Mr. Drame, I'm, I'm sorry. Niger capital of 400 ahead. kilometers from Gao while Gao is at 1,200 kilometers from Bamako. So that Gao is closer to Niger, Niamey, to Niamey, Niger capital, than to Malian capital. One can understand why the Nigerian, Nigerian authorities are concerned, a gravely, seriously concerned about what's happening in northern Mali and would like to find a solution within a regional frame, like the ECOWAS one, for instance. Mohamed Zitut, how likely is that to happen? Because there are reports from New York that there is some resistance among Security Council members uh, to adopt a UN Security Council resolution that would allow the use of force and military intervention by ECOWAS, by the AU, to re-establish order and to reinstate the, the previous civilian government in Mali. If military uh, force is used, that would by necessity involve the Algerian government, its military air force. Is, is Algeria ready for that? Let me first uh, tell um, His Excellency um, uh, that uh, Tuareg are human and they should be treated as human. And they shouldn't be uh, feel that um, they are under domination in what is uh, normally known or uh, called uh, their country. And I think in uh, Niger, in Mali, the Tuareg haven't been uh, well uh, treated. Uh, even uh, maybe very badly treated on the last um, 56 years, uh, uh, or at least since independence. Um, for the uh, Security Council, uh, definitely, I mean, it's very amazing to see that the Americans, who are usually um, they use the Security Council of uh, the United Nations to, uh, to declare wars, they are uh, the party which is against the use of force uh, against um, the groups in uh, North Mali. Uh, the, the French are uh, for uh, a full uh, war. They are uh, pushing, pressurizing um, the uh, ECOWAS, the uh, organization of ECOWAS, which is organization of um, some uh, uh, African uh, states, West, Western African states. Uh, and they are really uh, pushing too much um, uh, towards a war uh, uh, in, in the North Mali. But the Americans are against, and the Algerian the Algerian regime is against. I will not say Algeria, because let's not forget that um, we have got a dictators there, and the decisions are just taken by some, uh, the, the so-called decider, which means the generals and sometimes the president associated to right. that decision. In the short time yeah. left, though, I'm Le sorry for interrupting you, but I, I do have to move on to uh, Professor Keenan. If you could just put into context for us what the future of this region might look like, whether or not there will be military intervention to solve this. Is this a region that looks like it's entering a long period of instability? Or are we likely to see regional governments uh, rein in some of these uh, armed Islamist groups and also try to reach some kind of modus vivendi with, with some of these Tuareg uh, rebellious groups as well? Uh, I think the easiest side of this is to find some accommodation with the Tuareg groups. Uh, they will be happy under the present circumstances with some greater degree of autonomy. I think that will be ceded to them. If there is military intervention, certainly from ECOWAS, that's the regional group, this will lead to absolute chaos in the region. Uh, it will spill over quite likely into Niger and into wider regions. Mauritania will be drawn in. It could spread right across the, the Sahel. So military intervention is an extremely unwise action. 
Uh, the Security Council knows that, uh, and the reason for the American reticence, uh, that is one reason. The second reason is that the Americans know that Algeria is playing a large part behind this, and operationally, Algeria, uh, they hope, can at least rein this in when it is uh, satisfactory to do so. And that, I think, will lead to some sort of peace negotiation, probably drawn out over a long period of time, six months, 12 months, in which Algeria will be seen as playing the major role. Uh, and uh, Algeria will win all the accolades from the West uh, for once again uh, being the peacemaker in the region, when in fact it was the cause of most of the trouble to begin with. We'll have to leave our discussion here. Thank you to all my guests from London, Mohamed Larbizi Toot, also from London, Jeremy Keenan, and from Bamako, Tiebile Drame. And thank you for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. As always, we welcome your feedback. You can email us your thoughts at insidestory at aljazeera.net. From me, Rida Fakhri, and the team, thanks for watching.